for the first time. Welcome to Varathamira Science Forum's monthly lecture. <laughs> we usually have it the fourth Saturday of every month. Uh, today's speaker, Raghav, is working in the US. He's come to Chennai for a vacation. And he's leaving in a couple of days, so I offered to do this. And so, because he's leaving early, we you know, uh, we have taken this early slot. Even the hall is unusual. Uh, we've been doing this program at uh, Sastra Satsang Hall in Kodambakam for about uh, six or seven months now. They were an available in short, short notice. Unfortunately, this one was, so that's why we moved it here. I'll give a brief introduction to Varathamira um, Science Forum and to speaker of the day before we have, let us have the floor. I'd first like to thank everybody for uh, showing up on such large numbers today. We have, uh, after the COVID lockdowns, when we went online, uh, revival, fewer people have been attending on a regular basis. So, but, uh, so today we've had a full turnout. Uh, I think, uh, uh, I think perhaps it's the uh, topic itself, perhaps it's the offer of 3D printed uh, models, <laughs> the unannounced uh, D and some of the <laughs> um, uh, Perhaps the publicity because of the registration form uh, that our member, you know, our organizer Chandala gave us kind of good. Uh, so several things, but they're glad that several of you have shown up. Uh, so we started this forum several years back, 2017. Uh, this is forum was supposed to be a forum where we try to take science and technology to the general public without it being something that's affiliated to you know major institution. So what I mean by that is, if you want to talk, you listen to a talk on science and technology, you have to go to some major university or you know, hospital or some you know engineering firm or some company or something like that before you hear it because there's no forum where there is. Science, that there are science talks or technology talks for the general public. And so we thought uh, um, we already had we already have one forum going called Tamil Heritage Trust. We had lectures on history and heritage of Tamil uh, in India at large for over 11 years, 12 years now. And on that model, we thought we should have this forum. Now there are several heritage forums. There are several uh, fora where you know. We can speak about different aspects of culture. You know, we celebrate, you know, Carnatic music and all kinds of other aspects of, uh, you know, IPO right now, uh, and so many other aspects of Madras as a cultural city. We thought science is also part of our culture. We should celebrate that. And this is not the first series of such talks. We have had different groups and you know communities and clubs and uh, organizations organize and present public lectures in science. Uh, in the past decades, in the, in the entire past, you know, more than 100 years. And all those stuff have discontinued over time. They are not sustained. They have not gone for 10 years, 20 years, and then they have not sustained. Uh, so we started it off as an experiment. We didn't know if it would work. But fortunately, we are now in the sixth year. And we have only missed a couple of talks, monthly talks. So we are very delighted that uh, we are doing that uh, very well so far. Almost all our talks are on video. And they are on our website, on our YouTube channel. We are really not a very formal organization. Uh, we are really started off as a WhatsApp group, followed by a Facebook page, and then you know we added Twitter, Instagram. There is no formal organization as such. But besides the monthly lectures which we have conducted for so long, we also organized certain workshops. We have conducted certain, uh, we tried a science workshop for kids for five years back or four years back. Uh, then we conducted uh, series of a course, uh, two hours a week for about five weeks or six weeks or Indian astronomy and mathematics, then sort of specific subjects in mathematics like uh, Aryabhata, Skutaka, and uh, uh, Bhavana and Chakravada, which are very specific algorithms for a specific type of problem. One was Kutaka is for uh, simultaneous linear indeterminate equations. It just sounds very ominous, it's actually very simple. And then uh, Varga Prakriti and Bhavana is what uh, we, Bhavana is really composition of the, the, the second order indeterminate equations. And we have these marvelous methods created by Aryabhata, Brahmagupta, Leda Pascal, and others that regular math students don't study. So we kind of organize workshop for those. And we had some good feedback for those, even you know, when we connect with them online. We may do that also. 
Um, so that's for the group. If you want to follow us, just search for Manasa Vera Science Forum, either on YouTube or on Twitter or on you know just the general website where all our events are notified. Uh, there's nothing to join or anything, just attend the programs, that's all we ask for. Uh, so today's speaker, Raghav, uh, studied at SRM, is a native of Madras, effectively, he studied at uh, SRM College, Engineering College here. Then he went to Texas A&M, where I also studied, by the way. And he got his Master's in, at Texas A&M. And now he is working for a robotics company. Sharp Ninja. So he wants me to do very clearly say that 3D printing is not his profession, it's just something that is a hobby. Uh, so next time hopefully we'll get him to demonstrate robots and all that, right? So uh, so he wanted so the thing that instigated him is and you know heritage aspect of it, he went to Mahabali he, you know, we've seen all these monuments in Mahabali Puram. In fact, if you cross the Aya Bridge near Malad Hospital such as studios. There are two seated lions at the end of the bridge with a, you know, kind of a soldier riding on them. They are cement replicas of the original stone Palava sculptures that you find in the shoulder. And so he found a digital copy of it and printed it out. And then he offered to give the stock and so he said, you know, yeah, why not do it? So uh, thank you, Rago, for offering to talk. So I won't stand any further between him and you. I hope the uh, some of us have ready to you for the talk, and I know you're ready for the 3D printing. Thank you, Raghav. Thank you, Raghav. Thank you, Raghav. Okay, so uh, first and foremost, let me make sure there's enough batting in my laptop. Okay, so this is. Uh, as Goku kindly explained, uh, I am not somebody who is an expert in 3D printing. This has been my hobby. Uh, I've been in and around 3D printers for the last four years. I, I took a, my first exposure was I took a class in my master's where I did 3D printing as a class. So everything from designing to printing and the nuances of all of it. And then since then, I have never owned a 3D printer until about a month, a month ago. Right? I've had the opportunity to use 3D printer as a universities and everything. Um, so this talk is also going to be as informal as my expertise on this thing. So uh, what I'm going to be covering here is very simple. Uh, what is 3D printing? Some basic knowledge of the hobby itself. And if you want to start, what you need to know and where can you start? That's all. That's all it is. Uh, and then a demo, of course. So who am I? As uh, he kindly explained, graduate of Vidya Mandir in Mylapur. SRM and Marafani, uh, did a semester abroad at UC Davis, Texas A&M, uh, did my master's in computer engineering with a thesis in neuroscience with focus in AI and robotics. So I'm the kind of person with a finger in every pie. So I've done um, computer vision, machine learning, neuroscience, robotics, astronomy, heritage, 3D printing, uh, 3D printing, model making, photography. I, I like to do a little bit of everything. So it gives me a good amount of uh, so, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> Applause is always welcome. <laughs> no, I mean, this gives me an opportunity to take my knowledge from one field and apply it to the other. I am that kind of person. I am the jack of all trades. And I like to be interdisciplinary as much as I can. Um, so, that's my telescope that I have in the US. I have uh, used to have one in India as well. Um, as you said, I am a working shark ninja, software development engineer, as with every other Indian, you know. So, uh, so on to this. So, what is 3D printing? So, 3D printing in its essence is just a type of manufacturing, right? It is what we call additive manufacturing, as opposed to uh, molding is um, a form of shaping. You take a material, you shape it into something else. Um, or if you take uh, CNC machining, those are subtractive manufacturing. You take a block and then you reduce the stuff you don't need and you build something. Um, most of the temples you see are additive manufacturing. You make a block, put it in place, put a block above it, and then you have uh, a temple. The overall structure. And sculptures are sub subtract manufacturing. You take a block and then chip away and you have a sculpture you want. Um, I'm going to be making a lot of references to heritage and sculpture because that's also my uh, passion. I like to read about it, go to half the and all that stuff. Um, 
in short, this is a quick, fairly cost-effective manufacturing process. Um, it's cost-effective in the sense, if you want, say, 10 units of something, you wouldn't go to a mass manufacturer and ask them to make a mold and make 10 units of something. That's not cost-effective. It's going to be extremely expensive for you. Unless somebody has, say, you want a t-shirt with your custom photo printed on it. Somebody should already have a machine for it. So you're not going to go buy a machine just to print something on a t-shirt, right? Um, it's, but the more important fact of 3D printing that I want to highly emphasize is it is highly accessible. It is accessible everywhere around the world. Unfortunately, it's not quite as common as a hobby in India. Um, but I think from what I've met with friends, hobby in general itself is very low. Usually people play, play cricket or chess or something, they're into sports. Um, but they don't have a one type of hobby. Right? They, people take dance and art and everything, but these are sort of hobbies that are outside usual art. It's a very rare thing. It's usually just arts or sports, that's it. Um, I like to say that everybody should have three hobbies. One to make money, one to have a great outlet, and one to keep you fit. This is my great work. So that's that's what it is for me. Um, before I get into the idea of 3D printing, I want to put the idea that it's called a 3D printer, but it's more from a start. 3D, it's called a 3D printer because it's easier for people to understand, oh, okay, it's printing something. Yes, but it's more of making something. So it's more of a maker than a printer in a sense. Because I was explaining to somebody the other day uh, how this is a 3D printer and they were like, oh, but where is the paper or where is the ink? And, and they had a lot of questions because they tried to um, find an analogy between the inkjet or test jet printer that you have at home and this one. This is different. That's why you have lots of companies like MakerBot, MakerForge, or Maker who call it, they're all 3D printing companies, they make 3D printers, they've been in the business for more than a decade, uh, some more than a few decades. Um, but they all call it Maker, but in general it's called 3D printer. So the idea of 3D printing itself is proposed in 60s and 70s, 80s and 90s, saw some development, there were a bunch of patterns um, developed there. Uh, but in essence, in essence, it's just an XY plotter. If anybody knows what an XY plotter is, basically it's um, a surface with a with a gantry, is what they call it. This is what they call a gantry. So this moves, and this moves up. I don't want to move it, and then this moves this way. So you have three axes of freedom in this. Uh, general XY plotter has two. This has uh, four motors and three axes of freedom. I'll explain it. Um, this sort of became really popular in 2009 because a bunch of patents got expired and everybody was suddenly, this became, basically became open source. I'll come to the history part a little later, but basically there's a few types of 3D printing called FPM, SLS, SLA. SLA is the original one, SLS, was, SLS and FPM came very close after that. Uh, but they are, all the patents sort of expired between 2009 and 2013, so a lot of companies uh, saw the potential of making com uh, commercial products of this. Until then, it was locked to one company. They made printers, but only for industrial applications, and it was not for the consumer use. So, uh, I'm, I'm, the way this talk is going to be structured is I'm going to have a demo uh, to show everybody from start to end on the designing process and the manufacturing process. But before that, I just wanted to touch on questions like, is 3D printing for me? Why am I here? Right? You obviously saw 3D printing, maybe grab your attention somehow. And I want to put first on whether this is for you. First, you need, maybe you like the idea of tangible results. Um, software coding, for example, is not a tangible result. You type something, you don't get anything physically, but something happens on the screen, and I'm that first kind of person who took software engineering. I like doing it, but at one point, when there's no physical movement of anything, it's just numbers and text on screen, it doesn't, it does, I, I have a loss of attention sometimes. And the work I do is not like that. It makes a robot move, so I, that's cool for me. Um, second, you have a curiosity in engineering, manufacturing, or design. Uh, maybe you like making stuff, you're a maker. I'm a maker, I'm, I'm an artisan uh, or a maker. Uh, 
you have or you have maybe plenty of ideas to solve physical solutions around the house, but you don't know how to start, where to make, this is a great place, and you'll come to know why. Uh, or maybe you're just looking for a new hobby, right? Um, not everybody has to conform to sports or arts like that. Like, I, I don't. I, I don't play sports. I don't, I'm not an artist in any way. Um, and more importantly, you're going to face a lot of problems getting into this. As much as this 3D printing as a hobby is famous around the world as in many people do it, it's still a very small community in the global state. It's not as many people as who play chess or who play sports or who, um, I don't know, who paint, right? You're, not, you're going to face a lot of problems. And if you like the kind of facing the problems and finding solutions and overcoming those, then this is for you. OK, so I'm going to. I'm going to be explain, doing uh, the demo process starting now. Uh, as you can see, there's a 3D printer in front of you. Um, I'll explain the parts of a 3D printer once we finish the design and it starts printing. I think that way it's a little more easier for everybody to understand. Uh, but these are the tools I'm going to use. So I'm going to use a software tool called Shaper 3D to design my 3D model. Uh, we're going to make something called an STL file or a stereo lithograph file or a standard tessellation language file. The reason there's a confusion in the name is there, it's a backend. Back the first person who made it, 3D file called it an STL without an actual definition for it. So people put whatever definition they want. Um, the next thing we're going to do is use a software tool called Ultimate Cura to slice it, and I'll explain why we need it. And then this printer is called the Creality Ender 3 Pro, and that's what we're going to use to print the object that we just designed. Of course, there's plenty of options for each and every one of these. So if somebody says they're into 3D printing, they may not even have used any of these to get to where they are. So that's something I want to These are generally the most common ones that people use, but it's always there. All right. So let me uh, shape of the DVD. We're going to design this weird shape right now. Uh, we'll come to that on how we're going to design it. But for now, I'm going to delete it. I'm going to delete everything. All right. So. Okay, so I have a touchscreen laptop here. This is absolutely optional. You can use completely do it with a mouse. I forgot to bring my mouse. I'm going to be using my touchpad and touchscreen for this. Um, so can everybody see three axes here? X, Y, and Z, right? So the green is the um, Y axis, the red is X axis, and blue is Z axis. It's not that important, but you should know that we are in a three-dimensional space. That's what I'm basically uh, coming to. Right. So we're going to see from the top. So what do we need? So we're going to make a cube. We're going to make some, put some bolts in it. We're going to have something called overhangs, and we're going to put some text in it. Very simple. So this is going to be a completely custom object. Uh, the reason I took this is it's pretty simple to make. You can design it in like five minutes and we can do it together with some suggestions from you guys. Uh, and it takes very less time to print. So it takes about 30 minutes to print. Right? So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so let's start with a cube. I'm going to go to sketch, draw a rectangle. I'm going to do that. So that's a 100 by 100 square. We don't need that much. But I can go in and change these numbers. 20. Oh. I'm going to change this to 20. And now we have a 20 by 20 square. Right? So how do we go from a square to a cube? Anybody? Right. Yes. Should we pull it up, right? We do something called extrude. We go take that and we go up. And change this number to 20, and then suddenly we have a cube. Great. Now what? Now we want to put, um, I, I just want to demonstrate something else we can do with this, is we can change corners. For example, this one. I can pull it up to make it a rounded corner. So let's put that to the radius of 5 millimeters, for example. We can go to the opposite side. We can press that corner. And we can push it in for a flat one. I'm going to make that also 5 millimeters. So basically, um, I've taken off 5 millimeters in diagonal from it to make a cut. And this is a rounded corner. This is something you can do. Um, the next thing I want to do is 
make some calls. And does anybody have any suggestions on which direction we can make a hole? Anybody? X, Y, Z, pick one. Top. 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 You want to put from top? Sure. You want to put from this surface? Oh. You want to put from this surface or this surface? On, on, the, on the top. On the top. Okay, let's do the top. Maybe on the curved surface, that would be interesting. The curved surface? It's going to be a bit of a mess to start doing it. So for the sake of time, I'm going to pick the flat surface. Is that okay with you? It's okay. It will be more interesting. It will be more interesting for sure. So um, maybe we can try... If I do that, does that become a rounded surface? No. That's okay. Okay, let's, let's do here for the sake of time. So let's take a circle and draw a circle here of say five millimeter diameter, right? So what I'm doing here is called creating something called a parametric model where each dimension, every part of it has numbers attached to it and you can change one number and the entire model gets adjusted to it and everything. So I'm going to be referencing the word parametric often so that it's just mentioning it just in case. So once we have a circle, I can exit sketching, select that circle, and I can extrude for the Now, if you go in and see, I have a hole through my model. Right? Okay. Now, next I want to put, say, uh, a horizontal hole. Say I want to put it on this face. And I can create a circle again. That here's a four millimeter uh, circle. Same thing I can do. It's sketching. Select that, and I so now I have two holes. One at a diagonal of 45 degrees. The other one horizontally. Then I may want to add a text. Uh, does anybody have any suggestions on what text we can add? Yeah. Right. VSL. 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 Okay. Well, I'm made of whatever. Do whatever uh, works. Let's do add. We can go to text. Say, para media. That's a lot of characters. Let's do PSF. Right? And we can reduce that size to say six millimeters, even eight, seven, seven millimeters. And now we have text on our plot, but it doesn't have any depth to it. It's just text on the surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select each of these surfaces. Select each of these surfaces and I put an indent of about say one millimeter. So now we have text etched onto our block. Okay? Uh, another thing which is really cool that this printer can do is something called overhangs. Um, so if you look if you look at any object and there is something protruding to the side, this printer cannot print in space, right? It needs some support at the bottom. So I'm going to create an overhang and then add some supports to it uh, in the slicing program that I'll come to. Uh, so for the sake of that, I'm going to create say a simple rectangle for about that big, so about five millimeters by five millimeters. And I'm going to extrude that out. So circles are in, this is going to be out for about, say, five minutes. So I'm, this is, I'm, I'm defining this with a certain size in mind, uh, but we can scale the whole model up and down in our slicer again. But this is going to be a part. Is everybody happy with it? Does anybody want to make any other changes to it? Yes. Use it as extruding. Rather, you want it extruding rather than going, OK. Uh, how about we do one letter extruding on one letter inside, right? So we can do. Or you can extrude on another face. Oh, yeah, I do another face. Okay. Let's do. <coughs> what face do you want? Yeah. This one? Yeah. Okay. So let's take this and I'm going to go back to add text and I do another BSF here, 7 millimeters. I'm going to select. This, this, this. I'm going to extrude this out. 
by just one little bit. It's not much. There we go. Is everybody happy with the design now? I started with the cube only because uh, this is a very small cube. It's only by two centimeters by two centimeters. So it's not going to take much time. And uh, we're at 3, 4, 35, 4, 4, 30. OK. Definitely yeah, start with this. OK. So now I can just export this. And I have multiple file options here. I can choose STL, which is what I mentioned initially. Or I can choose 3MF. 3MF is also a 3D manufacturing format. It preserves any sort of rotation on you keep. STL does not. So STL keeps the assets as you find it. But if you have any rotations or scale, any sort of size constraints, then 3MF maintains it. So I'm just going to take that for an example. And we're going to call it PSF. Very technical here. Bear with me. This is just to start 3D print, and then we're going to go 
less technical from here. So between the slides now, it's going to have less supports. It's at 41 minutes. But I want this to finish before we leave. So I'm going to reduce this 20 millimeter height to say about uh, 14 millimeters. So it's much smaller now. As you can see, the entire model scale with the height. So everything is 14 by 14 by 17 because of the other extrusion we have. Uh, slice, that's about 21 minutes. Excellent, that's what we want, right? So now I can go to preview and I can see that I have supports. Now, there's a tiny micro SD card on the printer. I have put it into my laptop. And my slicer will automatically recognize that. And it gives me an option to save it to my removable drive. I'm going to save, take my model, put it back in here. <coughs> Start. So now, for the next 21 minutes, this printer is going to be printing whatever we just designed. That's what it's going to be doing. And why is yes? There's an input when you pull the printer. Oh, this one. This big spool here uh, is uh, is our input uh, material. It's basically PLA. I'll come to that. Uh, but the way the 3D printer works, I want to have a quick demonstration on my slicer while I have it. Is it prints in layers. It's not going to print a block out of nowhere, right? It's going to print one layer at a time. So let's, and this fun thing about the slicer is it slices the model I give it into layers. Now I can see it layer by layer. So that's the first layer it's going to print. So the outer lines you see is called a skirt. It's there to make sure that the printer can actually print on the bed. It's just so for us, when I look at it, when it's printing the skirt, I know, okay, the first layer is fine, because the first layer is the most crucial layer. The first layer is, works out well. The second layer is going to be on top of the first layer perfectly fine. Third is going to be on second, and I don't have to worry about the rest. So that's going to be my first layer. And as you can see, that 45 degree hole that we made has a dent there, and it's going to go up. Second layer, third layer, and you see these orange lines? These are called infill. So you can set that infill to whatever density you want. Uh, what do I have it right now? I have infill density to 10%. So basically what it means is only 10% of that interior space in that cube is, has plastic material in it, everything else is empty air. So when it prints it, it's going to have air in it, and then when it puts the last layer, it's, not, it's just going to trap all the air in. So we're going to have trapped air inside. And a lot of people use that to hide magnets in it, so you can have magic stuff which floats in magnetic space or something like that, or people who design it around it. How to make it lighter and heavier as well? Yes. So I can put 100% and make it a solid block if I wanted to. Uh, since this is just a demonstration thing, there's no need for density. Uh, but maybe you're making something like a hook for hanging t-shirts at back or whatever. Then you need something with 100% info so that it has the strength for it. I have a question. Yes. So this is an object which you created from scratch. Yes. Right. Yes. You designed from this scratch. Yes. So what about the photograph of some monument? I'm going to have a complete showcase of 3D things that I've made so far. I've made, uh, plenty of people have made different things. So it's, first of all, it's hard to uh, convert a photograph into a three-dimensional model. You can, there are AI tools right now where you can put a picture and it converts it into 3D models and stuff. That may not then, be then you have to perfect, right? Because you don't see one side of the object. So this is a website that I highly suggest, this is Thingiverse. Uh, it's completely free to use. You can make your own model, upload it, and you can go download whatever model you want. So people have printed, uh, for example, this is a portable air hop because nobody likes their neighbors apparently. So right, so you can print uh, the air horn in multiple files, put it together, uh, and you can print it. So people have created 3D models for it. Same way, there's 3D models for different things. For sculptures, it's much harder to come by because the people who are enthusiastic about sculptures has to be enthusiastic about 3D models to make them in the first place. There are people, by the way. There is, there is some, I found somebody on Facebook who makes these models. I reached out to him. Unfortunately, I didn't get back from him before this meeting. Uh, but he made models of... Um, uh, of by the way, Goku mentioned uh, you made a model. Right? Yes. So I didn't yeah. make the 3D model. You didn't? No. Somebody had made it and posted it online. I just downloaded it. So, since I got my printer a month ago, the only two models I've actually designed 
is uh, this cube, uh, one more cube like this, the first time I got it, I printed three printer printer fan regulator knob because we had one broken at home, so I printed it, put it there, now it's working at our home. Uh, so stuff like that, but mostly <coughs> oh, bobbin, yeah. So my mom wanted more bobbins for her uh, for her uh, sewing machine, so I printed a couple of bobbins as well. Uh, so it's stuff like that. I've not done anything too complex yet. So probably if there are 3D model files in other software, whether they can be exported into this stuff. Yes. Yes. That so there's plenty of software to convert one format to the yeah. other. Um, this this the whole photogrammetry part where you can take photos and make it into a 3D model with textures and colors. You can convert that into an STL or a and put it into a slicer. Uh, but yeah. So uh, we're talking about the 3D printer here. Did I answer all of your questions? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, as the 3D printer is printing, we're going to go through. Uh, some printing profiles that I've already set in this 3D print. I'm going to start it as a slideshow. So there was this 2G.61 here, something at the bottom, right? Sorry. The slicer? Uh, yeah, what does that mean? Oh, so 2G is 2 grams of filament. Two so it gives me a rough estimate of how much filament I'm going to be using. So it's going to be about 2 grams and uh, 0.61 meters of filament. So that's the 3D printing filament. I can actually pass around. I have some sample filament here that people can take a look. This is the kind of filament that goes around uh, if you want to take on this side and on this side. Uh, this filament is uh, a material called PLA or polylactic acid. It's about 1.75 millimeters in diameter. Uh, that's basically going through a heating and I'll come to that. Uh, so slicer, we can see it go up. Dark blue and orange. Uh, orange is the same thing. What is that? So dark blue is the interface between support and your actual object. So those, that's what breaks away pretty easily. So the rest is, the light blue is uh, structure support so that it doesn't break down. Dark blue so that it's going to touch the object so that gets printed. All of these are automatically generated by my slicer. So this is the smart part of the 3D printing, right? So this is what generates the slices and support material, but everything is the filament. Everything is the same filament. There's only one source of filament in this yeah. right. It's going to be used the same. There are many printers that can do support material in a different plastic and this one in a different plastic, but those are really expensive printers. This is about 80,000 rupees. Those start at about 3 lakhs. So there's a very large difference. How long does it take to set the It's heated, is it? Correct. So I'll come to that. Uh, so as you can see, these are different slices for your individual 3D prints. As I said, the V, S, and F are only a very minor extrusion, so I don't, they don't need support. And that's how our sliced material looks like. Now, this is important. I can come back to this at any point. People have questions after the talk as well. Uh, but you should really understand, this is how the 3D printer sees it. It sees raw commands. It says, go to X, Y, go to X, Y, go, go to this point in space. Uh, and extrude this much material at this speed. That's all it knows. And this software is what converts your three-dimensional model into G code. G code is basically cut the command code for the reading paper. Can we see a printed profile file? Printed profile. Uh, these are all my profiles. This is this is a whole bunch of numbers in here. But I'll come to it from the side. All these softwares are all Source they are all open source. Cura is, uh, I don't know if Cura is open source, but it's free to use. All the software that I use are free to use. I have not paid for any software. And some of them are open source. There are open source ones like um, Idea Maker, I think, is open source. But open source ones generally have a problem with the UI because each of them, because it's open source, it's built by a whole bunch of people. And it's not one person defining how UI should look. So there's no coherence in UI. There's a lot of bugs sometimes. So I prefer free to use software rather than open source software, although I support open source software. Okay, so printing profiles. Layer height is how many layers, uh, sorry, the height of each layer is going to print. So this printer can handle anywhere between point, uh, one millimeter, no, point 0.1 millimeter layer height to about 0.24. It really depends on the nozzle size. The nozzle for this is 0.4, that's the standard. That's not going to bigger or smaller nozzles. It's, it's a whole rabbit hole and I don't want to go there. Extrusion temperature, so this plastic is PLA or polylactic acid. It melts somewhere between 190 to 210 degrees Celsius. 
So this is set to 200 degrees Celsius. Now. That's generally the optimum temperature. You can play around with lower or higher temperatures. Um, and I'll come to it as to how it works. You had a question about uh, melting, right? You, uh, melting and it solidifying correctly. I'll come to that. Uh, bed temperature is usually set to the glass transition temperature of the material, where it just about starts to melt. So for PLA, it's about 60 degrees Celsius. So that's what the bed is at. So the reason the bed temperature is at that is so that it doesn't slip away when the top layers are printing. I'll show you examples on what happens when it does slip away. Uh, I can have it here. You get mess like this. So what had happened was it started printing this layer, or oh, sorry, this layer, and I intentionally made this to fail just to show uh, this here. Um, I reduced the bed temperature. I had the wrong. Huh? What is the bed temperature? Bed, no, uh, this is the bed. So the one it's printing on is the bed, and that actually heats up. That has a uh, heating element on it. So it, the entire thing is heated to 60 degrees Celsius. There's a feedback system which keeps it. Is it printing now? Yeah. Is it yeah, printing? Yeah. Yes, it's printing. Oh. You can see it moving on. Uh, so this moved with print, but the printer doesn't know that it moved. Right? So it's just printing in air for a while, and then somewhere something sticks again and starts printing again. Uh, I'll pass this around to where you can see how it's printing perfectly fine for a few layers, and then it's gone. Yeah, the bed temperature was set higher? Lower. So when you have lower bed temperature, what happens is the plastic, it, it, it's below the glass, uh, transition temperature, so it's solid. And I also had a wrong starting layer height, so I printed it slightly above the bed. So it didn't stick to the bed correctly. So as I said, the first layer has to print to the bed, uh, stick to the bed very well so that the upper layers work correctly. I intentionally fudge that so that it doesn't stick to it. To see what happens. So what do you do the uh, sorry, the lower layer becomes solid before the upper layer is printed. As soon as you extrude the material onto that, it becomes solid. And we want it to become solid as soon as possible. We don't want it to be in molten form for very long, otherwise it's going to start losing and flowing. Somebody else had a question here? Yeah, what do you, what do, you do with those uh, things which one does? Uh, usually it's trash or it's educational purpose right now. That's all it is. Uh, I'll come to recycling filament. There's 3D projects to recycling filament as well. Uh, so the next is uh, diffraction speed and distance. I don't want to go there. It, it reduces stringing. I have examples of stringing as well. Come back to it during the showcase. Uh, bed leveling. So another important part to 3D printing is making sure the bed is level to the printing X, Y, category. If that is not level, then what happens is at one point of the bed, it's going to print in air, and the other side is going to run into the bed. Right. So you want it to be exactly the same distance everywhere. Uh, I bought an additional sensor to this. Uh, it's about 500 rupees to add to this, which measures the bed at nine different points and offsets it while printing. So I don't have to keep it perfectly level every time. Uh, so great stuff. Uh, as I said, huge rabbit hole. We keep going up. So first layer is important. Bed addition is important. Uh, the speed at which you print is usually lower for the first layer. Uh, the height is slightly lower so that you squish onto the floor. Uh, and everything, extrusion rate and everything is slightly different. So this is the part of the 3D printer, right? I tend to compare it to a temple uh, because why not? I like this, that's also my passion, this is also my passion, and I like to uh, have commonality between them. Uh, so as I said, the base that you see with the, uh, see with the blue screen, uh, that's the base which has the white axis. You can see the bed moving forward and backward. That's uh, the base. The next is the print bed, which is the one that's actually moving. Uh, the base actually has a model at the back, people can come and look at it later, uh, which moves the bed system, which moves the bed forward and backward. Then uh, the print bed, which has the heating element on it, and where the actual print takes place. Um, the gantry, which has the hot end, as I call it, the one that melts the filament, which moves in the X axis. That has a motor on the side, uh, on my side here, also bell system. Um, and there's another motor on the uh, on the end of the gantry called the extruder, and the frame itself, and the frame itself, which gives you that height so that you can print in three dimensional of volume. And the top is the filament holder. As you can see, there's a big spool on it, and it's not in the picture. So here I'm using white PLA plastic again. So uh, extruder type. So this is under 
to aspect this very quick. It's not really necessary for this presentation, but I thought it would be interesting to mention here. There's two types of drives, border drive and direct drive. Border drive basically means, uh, so you see this filament here, right? It's coming down, and there's a motor here which pushes and pulls the filament wherever it's needed. So when I want more filament, it pushes it slowly, it keeps pushing it. And when I'm moving, where I don't want it, I pull it so that I create negative pressure that comes out. This box here is holds the hot end. Hot end is where the filament goes, and there's a heating element which raises it to 200 degrees Celsius, melts it, goes through a tiny nozzle onto the printer where it's being printed. Uh, this is pretty light. So the, the advantage of modern printer is this gantry holds very minimal weight, so you can print fast. You can print. Uh, you can move with less power required. Uh, whereas in the direct drive, this motor and uh, is on this gantry itself, so it directly pushes it onto the hot end. As you can see, it adds more weight to this gantry, uh, so it's sort of slower to move. And if you move it fast, then you will see problems in your print and stuff. But that's the two extruder types. Not too important for this presentation again. Uh, material types. This. Polylactic acid, which is what I'm using, it's cheapest, it's food safe, it's safe in the sense not, nothing really happens, it cools really, really fast, um, and it's one of the more popular filaments used. So you'll see variations of color, you'll see people mixing fabric into it, uh, metal film, uh, flakes into it, uh, you'll see uh, silk infusions, and all sorts of very interesting stuff. The next is ABS or electronometrile butadiene styrene. It's the original filament used for 3D printing back from 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, they are not. They do. They do melt with organic solvents, but they're not super great for the environment. So people sort of don't use it. But it's really tough. So if you want to make a hook, ABS is a very good option to make a hook out of uh, because it doesn't break easily. PPU is thermoplastic polyurethane. It's flexible. It's almost rubber-like. So people 3D print um, tires for remote control cars with PPU because it gives good grip to move around. Uh, PEP or PET, PEG is basically the materials your plastic bottles are made of. You can actually use that as filament. And there are open source projects which help you convert your water bottles into filament. You cut it into strings, put it through an extruder, melt it into 1.75 millimeter diameter filament like this, put it onto a spool, put it onto a 3D printer, and you get really excellent. Uh, results. I'm really planning to uh, make my own filament from that uh, over time. You can also do it with carbon fiber, but it's extremely expensive. But uh, to give a comparison, this filament about a kilogram is about 800 rupees to 1,000 rupees, whereas carbon fiber filament is probably a lakh for a kilogram. It's like really expensive, and the printers themselves cost in thousands of dollars. They start at four thousand dollars if you want to print with carbon fiber, uh, but you can. And it's very used. Uh, it's used highly by the space industry and the defense and everybody. The material type is tied to the printer. It's tied to how much the printer can do. So um, materials have a melting temperature. If your printer can go to that melting temperature, then generally it works. Uh, but also the uh, extruder motor should be able to grip onto the material. These are, um, I think, like brass. Uh, Gears that push it, you can change it to steel or iron or whatever. There's plenty of upgrades you can do. Um, but yeah, generally it's tied to whether your printer can melt the filament or not. That's mostly it. Supports, I'm going to show you supports with printing that. We don't leave, we leave that now. Uh, now, time for some history while it's still printing. How much do we have left? We're about 66% through, so we have another 7 or 8 minutes until the printing is done. Uh, any questions? You want you people to look at when it was printing? I well, it's going to cause a lot of confusion for people to come and see it, but I can start another print at the end so people can come sure. and see it. Sure. Okay. Um, any questions about? It? Yes. Normally, when you when you uh, extrude uh, substance at the extrusion interface, you're changing the state. Yes. The common problem that we have is uh, blockage. Yes. How does this affect? Excellent question. So the filament basically goes through a very tight nozzle, right? So it, this is 1.75 millimeters diameter, but the nozzle is 0.4 millimeters. So it's being pushed in, and as you said, clogging is a very common problem. And I have faced it. So when clogging happens, extrusion does not happen often. So this 
requires maintenance. So a, sort of a drawback to this hobby is you need to be ready to do that sort of maintenance. It's not, it's not like a phone or a keyboard, it's just plug and play and use it whenever you want. This requires maintenance in the sense every say 20 prints or every 20 days or whatever you want, you have you can take out the nozzle, open it up, heat it up, remove all the plastic and then put it back so that there's no clog. It did happen to me once and one of my prints failed. I can show you that too. I was printing a panel from, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that Rani Kiva uh, panel that actually yeah. out? So this. Oh, that is Amaravati from yes. London. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is uh, a panel from Amaravati that I wanted to print. It was printing like this. But as you can see, I'll come, I'll share it as well. As you can see, there is some problems with extrusion, right? You see lines there. And it becomes very fragile and it breaks. And it broke mid print, so I had to stop it. And stuff like this happens a lot um, with this book oh, So with this hobby, there's a lot of maintenance that needs to be done. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Any How other energy efficient the uh, I want to say this is about yes. the the power supply here is about 180 to 50 watts or so, uh, but it doesn't really pull that much. It pulls only about 80 watts or something while printing and supports up to 200 depending on the temperature goes up really high. Okay, let's go to history. So, uh, the first type of 3D printing actually that happened is called uh, SLA printing or stereo lithography is what the guy who invented it actually called it. Uh, idea from 60s and 70s, it got patented around 1980 and it expired in 2014. Uh, the way that was done was there is a vat of the resin and you have a plate called a build plate just like this one which goes into the resin. And if there's a gap of point, whatever your layer height needed from the bottom of the resin to the build plate, and that part has an LCD uh, screen on the bottom, which sort of hardens the resin wherever you want it, and then goes up, lets more resin in, comes back down to the next layer, hardens, and then it prints. Nowadays, you have uh, DLP uh, SLA printers, so basically the same technology used in uh, cinema projectors but you need size to fit into the size of sort, so you get higher quality. But even better is LCD panels. You have like 8K LCD panels about 7 inches wide, and so you have excellent resolution. Oh, I have to talk about resolution, but I, I can talk about this along with this. But SLA is basically just photo polymerization process, and for those finding, finding it difficult to say, it's basically photo as in light, polymer as in the plastic, make it into a polymer. Uh, polymerization is making it a polymer, a polymer process. This way, so there was a lot of tension going on and it caused problems in printing. Where if you pull the filament with this hesitation, uh, not hesitation, but there was some friction so it wouldn't, there was not enough material to print so we would have like gaps in printing and stuff. But once I added this, it sort of adds this curve and lowers that friction so much that you don't see the problem anymore. And this printed it like what, three hours, two hours of friction. Yes. Uh, I have seen uh, many people offering service of uh, offering a 3D miniature model of human beings, yes. especially your ancestors or someone like that. So for that, uh, what is the prerequisite? Is it uh, just a photograph or a photograph from a different profile? I'm model? not entirely familiar with what you're mentioning. Um, so they say that you can make a miniature model of your grandma or grandpa. Something similar to what I asked, right? I asked about modeling. So instead of creating your own model from the scratch, you have you to make make yes, 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 you can do that. So if you have photos from every angle of your ancestor, sure, you can make a 3D model. But not the, the elevation alone will not disappear. That's what I mentioned initially, where there are AI models to take a photograph and make gradients on object of it. For simpler shapes, it's, the, it's doing really well. But for human face, it does not work really well. Like from the front, it, you only see one uh, angle of it, right? When you move but around. For living people, we can do. Very yeah, if you, so they yeah. can be brought to studio and uh, yes, yes, basically yes, yes. Do scan. Special 3D camera, yes. it takes you, yes. then you can create a model. The funny thing, funny thing you mentioned CT scan is you can actually take CT scan images, put it as individual layers into a slicer, and 3D print your whole brain if you want. Yes. Up to high resolution. So, so resolution. Uh, this is far commoner than what the people here would think. In this city, in this place, practically 
dozens of such images are done every day. For example, I do jaw reconstruction in my work every day. Every patient goes and gets a 3D CT scan done. The image is called the DICOM image. The DICOM image is sent to the company. The company prints out a 3D model and also gives does it exactly where to cut, and they give the jib yeah. also to cut it. So it's very, very calm. Everybody is very She was actually mentioning just before the meeting that she has a fully 3D printed set of uh, dentures. Yeah. So, which is amazing, right? The, the, that's the uh, other end of the spectrum. Not as a hobby, but as an industrial application where uh, patients can improve their life. And she was mentioning how she can taste better and it just fits in the heart mouth so much better than yeah. so as, as, doc so, as doctor said. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> Yes. And as the doctor said, this is one industry where there's an immediate application. That's Before you operate on, they create a 3D model of the actual spine or brain, whichever area you want to do it. People, doctors practice or plan exactly what to cut and everything. It's a very serious thing. You, can, you don't have a second chance. So use it, then do the surgery later. Gee, that, that is the answer to the question you were talking about. Basically, they clone the human being without life. Practice, then go back. So he, was, he was asking about the, the image of uh, human being. The reason why you need the current person is the, the current CTs are 3D CTs. Yeah. When CTs came, they were not 3D CTs. Now they are three-dimensional CTs, high-resolution 3D CTs, and they get to a special image called the DICOM image. From where you can use all this? Yes. DICOM your standard medical standard interface. Standard. Yes. So they give a DICOM interface because otherwise old systems will not work. Any they automatically give an interface. Any other questions before we go to past uh, the three minutes down? So I have here a couple of seconds. Yes. Right. Somewhere in uh, UAE, they built a building or something. Oh, yeah. We, we did that in India too. The, many countries have taken this. Record, record time. Yes. So uh, that's again FPM model, fused deposition modeling, where instead of plastic filament, it is cement. So you just put cement layer by layer and you can make a house. So think of a house, right? It's just get a project. You can slice it down. You know where to print, where to put cement and where not to put cement. So there was a video somewhere where they built an entire house in like a day or something with just two people making sure there's no cement everywhere. Concrete. Concrete, sorry. Concrete. 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 Yes. But you need a printer which can melt metal and solidify it very quickly. Lars and Tubro just printed a uh, uh, post office uh -huh. in, in about 38 days. An entire post office was built by Lars and Tubro using 3D. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're all uh, industrial applications. Uh, there are companies which make rocket engines or entire rocket parts with just 3D printing. Um, in India, the defense is still using it a little bit, but from what I hear, I, I don't know uh, as much. But in the US, they like to really boast on everything they do. So they have companies which print rocket engines, come up with very unique designs. Um, a lot of design considerations so far has been around manufacturing uh, processes, right? Can I, I could design whatever I want, but can I actually make it? So I cannot, if, if it's, I cannot make an enclosed sphere with details inside because I cannot manufacture it. But a 3D printing, now I can. So it opens up. Uh, <laughs> The constraints of design, design constraints as well. It probably also helps you to check the strength of the model. Like yes. Once you make the support, then you know whether it's capable of standing or not. Yes. For actually building it, it's like yes. prototypes of change. It's a company called uh, Space Foundry, uh, which has done 3D printing in space from NASA. Oh yeah, uh, uh, once 2009 patents expired, 2014 NASA had a 3D printer in their compressor space station. Right. They printed, uh, I think the first one was a wrench or something, they printed it in space. And it, it, since then it's been really So, G4 does not, is not needed for this printer? No. For FDM... So can I put no. this upside down and print it? Yes. People have done it uh, really well. Uh, you can do it. The only yeah, the job is over. Yeah, yeah. So I, I just have two quick slides. Uh, so the cost for me so far uh, is eighteen thousand for the printer, five thousand rupees for the level of the sensor. So you want to be about eight hundred level? So um, this plate has to be perfectly on the level, right? If it is not, what happens is it prints filament in the air of this side and turns into the bed of this side. So every time I print, I have to make sure that the nozzle and the bed are at equidistance at every point and I can tune it with these wheels here 
and uh, move the bed up or down at each four different points, and I have to level it. But I can, but that's a strenuous process. It takes about 10 minutes for every print otherwise. So I bought this extra sensor here, which basically measures the distance between the nozzle and the bed relative to each other. And it creates a mesh. So here it says, oh, it's 5.7 millimeters from whatever. It's 5.4 millimeters from here. And it meshes it at nine different points and creates a mesh. So when I print it, it automatically, the, the gantry moves up and down depending on where the bed is. So if it's low on one side, high on the other side, it doesn't really bother the printer anymore. It, it, adding that and doing a firmware update basically takes care of that leveling process. It just, it's just me being lazy, honestly. That 5,000 is just so that I can shave 10 minutes before the machine thing. It will be clever. Yes. <laughs> so that's what it is. Um, setup time to build this is 120 minutes to an hour, including all the sensors and stuff. Uh, tinkering with it, I spent about 8 to 10 hours tinkering with it, figuring out, changing physical aspects of it. Um, I spent about 5 hours uh, fixing issues. Um, so as I said, I had a clogged muscle and it created absolute problems with print and I was devastated and then it took me like 2 hours to figure out what was actually happening, an hour to put everything back together after cleaning and then 2 hours to, and I was literally, I was about to cry and like why is this not working, I put everything back together, so that kind of frustration happens a lot but I love that, right, that's what keeps me going, it's like once I saw it I'm going to be like okay, the next time it happens I know exactly what's wrong and I don't have to spend 5 hours. Uh, learning. So as I said, I took a 3D printing class back in uh, Masters. So over the four years I spent well over 300 hours watching YouTube videos and studying for the class and everything. Um, I have deeper knowledge than what this 3D printer can do, but the 3D printer can only do so much. Uh, once I bought the printer, I probably watched another 10 hours of YouTube videos or learning uh, everything. What else is out there? As I said, it's a huge rabbit hole. You can keep going in terms of what filaments you can use, types of 3D printers, um, different plastics, metal, ceramic. You can print with ceramics. Um, the different software you can use to slice it differently. Um, and the funny thing is, every just like software, every field requires a physical model of some sort. Right? Take architecture. It will be awesome if you can 3D print your architecture, the awesome architecture that you design, to see if you have any issues on building it, or building itself could be used by 3D printing. Or, uh, as he said, you can make 3D models of jaws and dentures to see where the problem actually lies. Um, or entertainment sets. A lot of people use 3D printing to make uh, objects in physical for cinema and theater and everything. People cosplay. If you know, don't know what cosplay is, please do research for it. It's amazing. People dress up as the favorite characters they love, and they use 3D printing to make the spikes and horns and everything. So really very uh, and scientific models, of course, if you want to you know, model of the DNA or the model of the gene or whatever it is. And open source projects, it's, there's a huge global community for it. Um, relatively, as I said, much slower than chess or something. But it's still a huge global community. I really suggest everybody to go and check those out. Um, uh, where can you learn? So to start this presentation, I think is covered everything important in terms of what you would need uh, to know basics about 3D printing. I highly suggest go and watch YouTube. Uh, there's three channels that I mentioned here: Maker's News, who is uh, a huge 3D printing nerd. He's been doing it since 2009. Uh, he makes excellent videos. James Bruton is a robotics expert. He uses 3D printing to make robotic um, robot dogs, robot lightnings, different types of moving vehicles and stuff. Ivan Miranda, who basically 3D printed a huge 3D printer. A printer big enough for him to go live inside. So he made a 3D printer, I think it was something like 10 feet by 10 feet. This is 22 by 22 centimeters built plate, and that was like 10 feet by 10 feet built plate. So that's, he made that, and he had to get his own filament to do it and everything. Great plan. Um, websites, all 3 db great website thingy was the one I showed you where you can get three models. I suggest go look at it, see what kind of stuff people design sort of gives you creativity. Uh, 3D Insider for more history and information and stuff. Uh, maker spaces. I understand that 18,000 rupees is not cheap. It's, uh, I mentioned it's cost effective, but 18,000 rupees is still 18,000 rupees. But there are something called maker spaces 
all around the world. Um, generally, this modern every major city where they have 3D printers, they have laser engraving machines, they have um, drill presses and soldering stations and everything. All you need is an idea, right? And there's one in Tamaram Sanatoria, I tried reaching out, they don't have a phone number on their website, they've not updated anything since 2020, I don't even know if they're alive. But um, if anybody can find them, uh, please let me know. Their, web their website says it's only about 500 rupees per month subscription, like a membership fee or you can pay 100 rupees a day to go use their facilities. So if you have a 3D model that you want to print, you can use it and you just print it for a day and pay 100 rupees and get it back. Um, I have links for maker spaces around India from the same people who made one in Chennai. Uh, IIT Delhi and IIIT Delhi both have labs for their students that any, all, any of their students can go study. I'm sure IIT Madras has one, but I couldn't find something like that. Uh, but yeah. For try to find maker spaces needed. Oh, another fun thing is we can also find 3D pens. 3D mm -hmm. pens are basically just extruded on the hot end without all of this janky and okay. expensive stuff. I have one here which I bought back in 20, 20, 2019, I think. Uh, this is how it basically looks. It uses the same filament as this one. You plug it into a power, it melts it, and it keeps extruding filament. Okay. And this one has an XY plot on it, right? XYZ plot that if you find. Uh, this one does not. You are the potter. So you can go, you can go to X, Y, Z, whatever. Uh, there's a guy called 3D Sanago, he's from South Korea. He makes excellent, he's a 3D pen artist. Uh, he makes excellent videos. I highly suggest go look at it with subtitles. He's really funny as well. Um, and you can buy that 3D pen for like 1,500 rupees, which is much cheaper. And if you want to really try uh, figuring out working with 3D pens, that's a great place to start as well. Just thought I should mention that. Oh, good job, guys. Okay. So now for the fun part. We have our model printed here. Any questions before we go to showcase? I'm basically done. I'm just going to be sending out some models that I've printed, so doing some explanations. Any questions? Yes. You mentioned metal. Aside from the top yes. The material that you mentioned, the like ABS and uh, PL. Did any of that relates to metal? Then? No, both, both are plastic. They're all plastic. Everything plastic. on that slide was plastic except plastic. for my carbon fiber one. Uh, but there's also, you can print in nylon and stuff. But yeah, but metal 3D printers are a completely different um, ball game. So, welding is technically a 3D printing, right? Because you fuse and deposit material onto something. That's what met welding is. Imagine a welder on an XY quarter of the Z axis. That's your three metal 3D printer. So you just keep feeding it filament from somewhere and it can weld things together for you. But it's not as clean as you would expect it to be, but once you give it to a machine, maybe it can do it clean. I, I don't really study that much. You're talking about infusing uh, silk and uh, things like yes. What exactly is it? So uh, what, I, I'm not exa exactly sure what it is, but from what I understand, it's basically silk fibers being mixed into the plastic, into this filament itself. So it gives a shine like silk. So when you print it, it's still plastic with a little bit of fibers in it, and it gives that excellent silky shine that you can see. How does it uh, shine? Yes. How does it melt? You know, I think the temperature is high enough for the fibers to melt into the plastic without causing issues. I have not used it. I have not seen a printer that can do it. But apparently you can do it with this printer. It's just a filament you need. Uh, but they are generally more expensive, like two times the cost of this. And, and change the settings for that appropriately in Not thing. much, it's just temperature, yes. Yeah, for yes. to my design. Hmm. Sorry? Is it finding out the figure? Yes. Ah, the, the maker space is not up, so... There are labs, the 3D printer, printer lab. Yeah. Go with your model, get it printed. There are people who own 3D printers. You can put it in your model, you can print it in there is one in Kotor Brown, near yeah, Kotor Brown. Oh, there is? One Excellent. Kotor. Company. So it's basically like Kotor. Company. It's a company. There I see. Okay. I know. Even individuals can approach. Oh, I see. I saw plenty yeah. of yeah. services like that where if you're running a company and you want prototypes for your product, then they do it for you. But I've not seen anything for a personal copy level basis. So uh, even today, the large scale mass production of artifacts, uh, we have to rely on the dye technology. But before, I go for uh, making a dye. So does it make sense to go for 3D print and then go for dye? Yes. Because dye course, cost is uh, yes. very high. 3D printing is solely for prototype. 
So if you want, if you're making a consumer product, like I, I work in a company which makes robot vacuums. We use 3D printers to build uh, prototypes to see whether it's mechanically do they fit together. Uh, do I have to change the size or the shape? Otherwise, does it clean well and stuff like that before we uh, come into tooling and mass manufacturing processes? And this cannot be used for mass manufacturing. They are not cost or time efficient because while it's quick for prototyping, they are not quick enough for mass production. I think for artificial models, there are a lot of Yes. Uh, this is a bust of FRT that I 3D printed. I'll, I'll send the whole box yeah, yeah. around. But no, yeah, in the LRMR at home. Okay, yeah. You can see the machine and the model. Sure. So, uh, back to our. So, all these you put the models from the site? Yes. So, any, so if, if you want a 3D model of a sculpture from a museum, you can use the Freedom of Information app to actually request the 3D model. Most museums go out of their way to 3D scan all the stuff they have so that they can create a digital library because that makes them money too. That's the form of showing off saying, hey, I have something important. And you bring that straight into Slender? You can, uh, it depends on what format they have. You may have to put it into a 3D modeling software like Blender to convert it into an STL or PMF and then put it into a slicer. But yes, it's very cool. That's what I did with the show, show me the model. Oh, well, that's the model I made just now. Uh, you can see that the VSF logo extruded and the one inside came out pretty well. Uh, I'm going to leave the support on. Uh, if anybody wants to remove the support, you can. It's hard to remove the support without, well, while you, it's hard to break the subject while removing the support, so you don't have to worry about breaking things. So, anybody one question. Yes. I see that one of them is in black. All right, leave it here. Yeah. One of them is in black. Yes. Because most of them are in the color that Yes. So I, this is actually from a 3D printer that I have at work in US. So uh, a funny story is uh, I came here April 8th or so. Ma March midweek, one of my colleagues had a 3D printer. He said he bought it in 2017 and it's not used. So he put it in workplace in our lab. So we were basically messing with it and printing different stuff. This is from there. You can look at the bottom of it. It doesn't print really well because the printer is 2017. This is a printer from 2022. So how does it, that's a different PLA, right? It's just a different color of the same material. This is also PLA, this is also PLA. This is white, I have gold, this is black. Uh, that's three so colors. So you want to have two or three colors in the same block? Yes. What you need you with, a, with a more expensive 3D printer, you can. <laughs> so you can either, the 3D printers which can take different filaments. So either it will print to a certain point, it will pause, and then you change the filament yourself, which you can do with this too. Or the 3D printers which have two extruder units, with two filaments, and it just it prints one moves away, prints the other one moves away, print, and you can have different colors. Exactly like drawings, who first print in black and white, and then multiply like that. Same. Same. Very similar. It's hard. There's also yeah. The yeah. interface for number, number like multiply. Yeah, yeah. You you can still print it in two different pieces. Let's see. I think it's not common. Yeah, you can come and see. There's not much else. Any questions? Uh, can everybody point out a little bit? I can't hear the question. Yeah, yeah, there's plenty of software. These are all as I said, just an example software. We conclude our DSF with a small gift with your best wishes and blessings to our Chinese customers. Uh, stuff like this, 
We are printed in multiple points.